All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to just, I know people are filtering in and getting admitted from the waiting room. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just by way of a quick introduction, my name is Holly Borum, and I'm here to welcome you to our book party. This event is sponsored by the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography, which is associated with Rare Book School. The purpose of our book parties is to celebrate the wonderful work of our fellows. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from senior fellow Andrew Bricker. Andrew is assistant professor of English in the Department of Literary Studies at Ghent University. His research focuses on interdisciplinary approaches to satire, the law, laughter, and humor. I will say I personally went on a trip with Andrew through Rare Book School, and I always loved sitting on the bus next to him because he had the most wry and hilarious comments. So um, it kind of doesn't surprise me that that's what his research is on. Um, his first book that we are celebrating today is Libel and Lampoon, Satire in the Courts, 1670 to 1792, published by Oxford University Press. Um, Andrew tells me has been available in the UK and as of April 10th, it's now available um, in the US as well um, from Oxford University Press's website. Um, he is going to be interviewed today by uh, Marissa Nicosia, who is Associate Professor of Renaissance Literature at Penn State Abingdon. Um, she also is a senior fellow in the Andrew, Mellon Society of Fel Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Uh, she works on early modern English literature, book history, and manuscripts, and she runs the public food history website, Cooking in the Archives. As for the format today, uh, Marissa will lead the conversation with Andrew. We'll leave the chat open, so please feel free to drop your questions in there as we go along. After about 40 minutes, uh, Marissa will wrap up, and I'll start posing your questions to Andrew um, the ones that have been dropped into the chat. You're also welcome at that point too um, to come off of mute and ask questions so that we can have more of kind of a group conversation. Um, and then we will wrap up within the hour. So at this point, I'm gonna um, turn my video off and mute myself and let the conversation begin. So again, welcome and thank you so much, Andrew and Marissa. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, Andrew, it's been a real pleasure reading Libel and Lampoon, Satire in the Courts, 1670 to 1792. Um, we've been talking about your work on satire since we first met in 2013 at the very beginning of this whole um, Mellon Bibliography Rare Book School group. Um, and I wanted to start off by reading a moment that's actually in the epilogue of your book, where you quote the epigraph of your book and situate it in context, because I think it really captures the way that you track both metaphor and material textual aspects of um, satire and the law throughout the book. So um, this is page 256. As I have argued throughout Libel and Lampoon, the appropriation and then radical modification of libel laws was in part a response to the verbal evasions that had come to typify satire during its golden age. Onlookers, moreover, noticed, and this is where you're quoting a 1740 source, judges and juries, one critic observed in 1740, have been forced to, quote, stretch the laws to convict these sophists in calumny. Um, but the courts had done so with good reason. And this is the longer quote. So perfect are these libelers in all the tricks and wiles of ambiguity and equivocation in the mysterious art of raising ideas by the use of words of any contrary signification, of abusing and vilifying by affected and commonums, uh, uh, in commonums, of sneering truth by writing it in italics, of assassinating with a simile or betraying with a kiss, end quote. And you write, in the absence of positive law, judges were forced to appropriate libel laws, turning them into a post-publication regulatory mechanism for an increasingly unruly press. And I, I was going to start with that quote when I read the epigram, but when I saw you really work on it and like expand on it here in the epilogue, I was like, yes, I'm onto something. Um, and I, I like how you, this 
particular person thinking in 1740 talks about the idea of italics or using expressive typography in the printed versions of satires as a way to cue in, oh, there's something going on here. There might be another level of meaning here. But then you're also talking about um, the contrary, uh, this, this writer's also taught, and you draw out the contrary signification, the simile, the ways that rhetoric or, or certain forms of um, rhetorical modes are enabling satire to um, pass muster um, once it's circulating in the world. So um, I think that that stands in, that, that this moment really stands in nicely for what the book is doing overall. Um, and you're welcome to respond to that, but I also wanted to start our conversation off by asking you about the origins of the project and some pivotal moments in its development. Yeah, okay, well, th thank you for joining. Thank you for reading it. You might be one of the you know, first readers of the book to go cover to cover. So I thank you for doing that. Um, and I think the, that that epigram, you know, I, I added it very, very late to the book. And I think the reason I added it really late was because I realized I was actually quoting from that pamphlet repeatedly. Um, and I'd never actually given the full quotation. It's quite a long quotation to start the epigram. And I suppose retrospectively, I realized that um, the summary of the book was pretty much accurately done by this one person in 1740. And so I felt, somewhat uh, justified, but also obligated to put that epigram right at the beginning of the book. But uh, okay, so where did the book start? As with many people, my book started as a dissertation project. And I think at the time that I was trying to put together a dissertation project or sort of like what was gonna drive it, I felt fairly confident I wanted to work on satire. And I think for a lot of people who've worked on sort of 17th and 18th century satire, I was struck by the level of personal animus, it seemed to me, that existed in these works of literature. And I was fairly positive that, as with any kind of speech act, there were rules governing it. And a lot of those rules were probably social and implicit, and occasionally explicit, of course. But as with a lot of sort of the way you or I would interact, it's governed anthropologically through a whole series of conventions. And so I thought there must be a similar set of social or anthropological conventions governing what you can or cannot say about somebody in a work of satire. And I sort of made it my project to try and figure out what were the unwritten rules of satiric speech. Yeah. And one source I thought among many, many other sources would be the law, that the law has long governed um, the kind of speech you are allowed to make publicly or even sometimes privately about other people. And I thought this might be one fruitful source for working out those rules. And it was one of those things where I, I started on the law and then I was never able to leave it. Um, and it sort of consumed the entire project. And so I think that the person who deserves most credit is somebody you know, and it's Blair Hawksby, who was on my dissertation committee and had read a not very good prospectus on the anthropology of satire that I'd written and had pointed his finger exactly at the legal part and said, I hadn't really heard much about this. And yet it seems really interesting and really potentially productive. So I think that was the, the starting point for the project. Um, and it's, yeah, it's sustained me now for a good 10 years, I guess. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. And that's awesome that there was a moment where, where that pointing took you in a different direction, right? And I, what I found so interesting about this is because I've read about law and literature in the early modern period and, and my work's more, a little bit more, in my, I'm more at home in the 17th century, right? Um, so I'm familiar with law and literature and I'm also familiar with changing press regulations and what the copyright structures look like before 1695. Mm -hmm. um, but what was so interesting about what you were doing and, and like copyright law is pretty standard business for book historians, like we need to understand some of that. But you're tracing this really different dynamic exchange where um, the courts are innovating in response to what publishers, stationers, and writers are doing, and then the writers and stationers are trying to interpret the law. And I was so interested in these moments where um, these innovations are happening or where people are just getting things wrong, like they think they're up to date with the law, um, but they're not. And uh, I wondered, 
um, if you could say a little bit more about that dynamic exchange. And um, it, it really made me wonder about some of the things I've taken for granted on the status of law and the press in 17th century, right? Mm -hmm. Like I wanna go back and think more about that after having read this. So um, I wonder if you could speak just to that dy dynamic that's so rich in this book and it's very different from other places where I've read about law and literature together. Yeah, so I think, I think for me, um, well, so it's interesting talking with you, right? Because I think with a lot of scholars of early modern literature who will track legal regulations, they'll usually pick 1695 as a kind of endpoint because the moment at which England moves from a system of pre-publication licensing mm -hmm. to post-publication prosecution. And it's at that point that the entire regulatory apparatus of publishing changes, you know, not entirely, of course, the stationers company still plays a really important role in all of this. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, um, from the position of the authorities, right, that the people now who are tasked with trying to find ways to limit press freedom, or at least regulate members of the press, including authors, um, but not through pre-publication strategy. Yeah. So, so that was sort of, I think, uh, an appropriate starting point, end point for a lot of different scholars. And I was interested in tracking, you know, what happens before and then what happens after this break in 1695. And I think one of the reasons why so many booksellers, publishers, printers, but also authors were confused about the law was because libel laws, which become the primary apparatus for prosecuting writers. And this is a weird hangover that we still have in yeah. Anglo-American law and Commonwealth law that libel law, which had been historically for interpersonal squabbles, yeah. right? Like personal forms of defamation suddenly becomes a political tool and suddenly becomes this way to regulate the press on mass is I think really, really interesting and creates all of these new problems. And one of them is just the problem of common law. There's not like this big black book yeah. that everyone can consult at the beginning of every year and ask what are the current press regulations? They're evolving and they're evolving very, very quickly during this period in the late 17th century and the early 18th century. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is a lot of authors at sort of the verbal level and then printers and booksellers at the more bibliographical level trying out new strategies and a lot of those new strategies become staples of publishing across the 18th century and a lot of those especially rhetorical strategies around verbal evasion irony metaphor parody actually become a fundamental part of the architecture of satire so much so that even today right when you watch satiric tv programs they're still using a lot of the same verbal strategies that people were using in the early 18th century. Um, and for them, it's just, oh, that's how you do satire, right? That's how you do sketch comedy. That's how you tell a joke. But in the early 18th century, those strategies were, that's how you avoid being successfully prosecuted for a libel, either on an individual or on a politician, or even potentially as the century progresses on the government itself or the crown itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was haunted by your invocation of William Prynne in your introduction as this like material physical warning because he has the SL seditious libeler um, branded on his cheek and he's walking around like he's in the West End until 1669 mm -hmm. like where, where some of your story begins in that kind of post-restoration moment um, and he's like the haunting of the libel that's to, like the libel legislation that's to come right that li the libel procedures that are that are coming but we're not as much a part of the 17th century apparatus mm -hmm. yeah 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 no and it's and it's interesting right like I think I think when we or at least with lots of legal historians but also literary historians when we look back on the 18th century it looks pretty free to us right because we can kind of see it from the perspective of say the 19th century and the 20th century and a pretty gradual diminishment of the controls that are in place but I think if you're living in say 1669, those controls are very, very real and the consequences can be all sorts of forms of capital punishment. And that actually stays true all the way up through the 1720s and 30s. So we don't have people being um, hanged for crimes anymore after, uh, hanged for publication crimes after the 1730s. We don't even have people being pilloried anymore after a certain period. 
But everyone kind of kept an institutional memory about these things and knew people who had been prosecuted and knew people who had been hanged within the trade and knew people who had been pilloried in public, often to really grave and sometimes even capital extents. And so I think, yes, like you could say, oh, in 1760, the worst thing that happens to you is, you know, you pay a fine, you keep your nose clean for two years, and then you go back to publishing. But all of those printers living in the 1760s know what happened in the 1740s and happened in the 1730s and were trained by people working in the 1720s. Yeah. And so I think there's a sort of real living institutional memory that at any point, maybe all of that supposed progress towards a freer press could be taken away. Yeah. And that's sort of like, you think of the Wilkes and Liberties campaign things right in the 1760s, that's the fear. And that's the fear on the American side of the ocean, right? That, yeah that the same sort of bad, uh, you know, crony judges and secret service agents who had persecuted Britons a century earlier were coming back and that American colonists were at threat at, at the, from the very sort of print apparatus that had sort of ceased to exist, at least theoretically, mm -hmm. decades, if not a century earlier. Absolutely. It really changes the stakes of the history of reading. Mm -hmm. Right, um, because it's not the history of reading. Just because, like, it's not that publishers are, are reading simply because they want to make money. They're mm -hmm. reading and they're editing and they're thinking about how they're going to like employ the bibliographical codes of satire that you note to make profit, but also to protect their embodied selves yeah. um, in a way that doesn't align with with um, a lot of our stereotypes about the Enlightenment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I do, I do tend to harp pretty hard on the idea that there is an economic self-interest at work throughout all debates around freedom of the press, right? So that yeah. you, the advocates, of course, might be theoretically free speech absolutists who believe in a deep philosophical enlightenment sense that all speech should be um, free and open and accessible. But there's also this sort of kind of uh, you know more practical, slightly grosser commercial aspect of the publishing industry, which is, you know, if you suddenly have a world of total free speech, you've eliminated this incredible range of variables around prosecution, economic costs, um, sort of processes of editing, things like that, but also created greater safety for yourself, both as a financial or economic actor and as a person who could potentially be imprisoned, right? So that even if you don't have hangings and even if you don't have pillorying anymore for publication offenses, people could be jailed and they could be jailed for significant periods of time. And we, we have lots of examples of individuals with spottier health in the book trade who died while awaiting effectively either some kind of sentencing or even just waiting for something to go before a grand jury in terms of an indictment. Yeah. Yeah. I want to stick on the history of reading a little bit, mm -hmm. because I think um, when I was reading the book, I was feeling this is very sh sharp, like authorship, reading, publication, <laughs> right, are like the, the things that keep coming up for me. And I thought, and I think the history of reading interventions that your book makes will be of great interest, both to the people on this call who are here for critical bibliography, and the people on this call who might be from literary studies, because I think what you're doing with both your engagements in material text studies and critical bibliography, and in literary studies and debates around reading are really crucial. And I guess like the third field would be law and literature, but these two, I think, speak best to, to the audience we've got here today and to, to what I know about, because you have this, you have so many readers, you have this constellation of the writers of satires, and then our, we have stationers and scribes who are involved in the circulation, we have reading publics, and then we have lawyers, judges, and jurors who all have to be like readers scripted into certain roles. And then towards your end of your book, we move to visual media, we have artists and we have like performers as well. And they're reading in both prescribed and idiosyncratic ways. And on the more literary side, we have like evasion and irony and allegory and how those modes of, um, of reading our, our work in the genre of satire and how it's in dialogue with the law. And then the bibliographic codes like title pages and guttered names um, that, are, that are clues and, and some of the false imprints and title page conventions that you share. Um, and, and then um, and later in the book, um, caricature and extra textual aspects of performance. So we, we have 
all of these different kinds of readers who are either reading the way people, the way someone wants them to be or the way someone doesn't want. Like, so reading the way the judge wants you to read yeah. as a juror or reading the way the printer wants you to read so you know it's a satire and you're mm -hmm. cute to go in. So I, I, from, I, I think that this creates a, a real intervention in how we think about the history of reading on the bibliographical side, but also in literary studies that you're tapping into all these debates around intention, like suspicious readers and surface reading, um, historical formalism and how like particular figures or uh, modes like um, irony can get us into um, certain head spaces. So I wondered if you could just speak to those questions more generally, because I, I saw that as a really exciting, those two things as really exciting avenues that this book is exploring that would be of interest to people here. Yeah, God, I, it's tough, right? Because I think I didn't set out to write a book that was about the history of reading. And yet, I think working with satires, and especially verbally ambiguous and bibliographically ambiguous satires, meant that anyone who encountered those works would have to perform a somewhat high level interpretive act, right? They, they weren't purely communicative in a simple or direct way. So mm -hmm. as a result, I think probably every chapter has something to say about the theoretical and then practical aspects of reading particularly works of satire. And the group that I was always most interested in were the jurors. Um, so, because it, the, the jurors were, you know, it's, it's one of these really strange things. We don't have a lot of accounts of reading during the early modern period up through the 18th century in the sense of there was not like great test groups available for us uh, who then sort of read individual works of fiction or something like that and then filled out questionnaires. We're, we're really stuck often with material markers of reading. So yeah. what did people put right in margins? And, and with these legal prosecutions, in terms of the archives I was using, I, I, I sort of honed in quite a bit on depositions or affidavits from the period. And the reason I found these so interesting is they were usually affidavits given by printers or publishers um, to a government figure. And sometimes if I was lucky, they would include a copy of the work that was subject potentially to a libel prosecution. And if I was really lucky, on that document, um, some individual probably tied to the Secretary of State's office would have put notes identifying precisely what they believed to be libelous and why they thought it was libelous. And so that's like one really interesting aspect of the yeah. history of reading, right? We have somebody who is a very instrumentalist kind of reader, a reader who's looking for something in particular, and we're getting positive evidence of their identification of that particular thing, right? So what is libelous? And they find it. On the other side, that has to go to courtrooms and juries um, are often tasked in very, very precise way by the judge to read in certain ways. So the prosecution says, I'm gonna give you this poem and we believe the poem means X thing, X defamatory thing. But all we're asking you to decide is whether you agree with that interpretation. And jurors say, no, 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 we don't wanna do this like, do you agree with this interpretation? We wanna interpret it ourselves. And then we wanna tell you whether we think that interpretation is libelous or not. And the question of whether something's libelous or defamatory is a question for judges, not for juries. And so one battle you have that goes on across the whole book, but also across this sort of hundred yeah. year period I'm studying is jurors pushing to address what they call the whole matter. And so, I, I mean, this is why I found these legal cases so interesting is you would have, uh, you know, something approaching like a small critical mass of jurors, but then also attorneys and judges and then very often authors and publishers claiming what they believe something meant and the reasons they believe that, whether it was verbal kinds of evidence or whether it was bibliographical kinds of evidence or whether it was purely intuition based. And, and I think one thing that keeps coming up, especially with works of satire is, you know, even today, sometimes our theoretical models are insufficient to explain how we arrive at a sense of the meaning of a, a given work of satire, because so much of our response seems to be habituated through intuition to works of satire, right? And sometimes it's simple as, 
do you find it funny or not? And from that position, do you in turn understand what you believe to be a message that's being presented in that work of satire? And then in turn, do you agree with that message? Or do you, you know, and so, so I think it's a, satire is really nice because it has this kind of multi-level intentionality, but then also these different kinds of heuristics of interpretation, none of which is kind of sufficient on its own. Yeah, and it doesn't, the process of reading that you're, you've just walked us through doesn't align neatly with any of the major theories of reading that are currently being actively debated in the more theoretical yeah. parts of literary studies. Um, and they diverge really broadly from what the reading that I've done in the history of reading in the early modern period where um, commonplacing or annotation or, or those material correlatives that you've talked about or you mentioned are so important or things like Zachary Lesser's um, Renaissance Drama and the Politics of Publication, a book, he, I mean, he was one of my mentors and that book's very foundational to the way I think about like how printers decide what to print yeah. um, and where publishers are readers who are investing capital and your work does not disagree with that, of course, but however, you have these cases of publishers who are saying, well, I never read it or um, or they're in this um, intense editorial relationship with their authors where they're rewriting um, some of your case studies um, from um, the second chapter of your book using Swift, like, so a manuscript is carried from Dublin to London, not in Swift's hand, and then it gets edited at length by the publisher, and then it gets published without a lot of the identifying information of any of the people involved. And there's these claims to not reading that are so important in this workaround. And then on the other hand, as you were just saying, you have these juries who are like, can we read and make the interpretations ourselves? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's putting um, the agency of being the reader in a lot of different places, and also these like, disavowals of reading in places where I was expecting to find like avowals of like, well, I read and committed my capital to publishing this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, and so I think like satire is such an interesting case study for it too, because I think in, in the, in the history of reading, but in literary studies more generally, I think, you know, it would not be a controversial thing to say that most literary historians um, don't dabble around in intentionality, right? They sort of say, this is, this is too difficult to deal with. Um, you know, it's, it's rummaging around in someone else's mind to try and arrive at meaning. And so I'd say as a general principle, we just sort of accept that to be true. And so we sort of push intentionality aside, right? Mm -hmm. But intentionality is central to the law and intentionality is usually characterized as malice, right? A sort of um, an intention to do an yeah. act of a certain type. And so that's really essential, even if you think of, of um, homicide laws, what would sort of establish you for a manslaughter or something. So the law is very interested in intentionality. And satire is, I would say, the one literary form that really requires a sense of intentionality around it. So Robert Fidian, um, whose work I quite mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. sort of has claimed that, you know, satire is this one literary form that doesn't make any sense unless in some ways you refer to the shaping intention that had produced that work. Because satirists don't say things directly. They have something they want you to know. Um, but they don't sort of lay it out in nice, clean and tidy ways for you. And so I think, I think there's a ways in which the, the watching satire across the 18th century is an interesting test case for the usefulness of intentionality, but then putting it in these legal contexts where you have rep repetitive interpretation, particularly around what an author meant by a certain thing and whether that therefore would qualify as seditious or defamatory is a really sort of essential feature of satiric discourse in particular. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know, I like, I haven't come up with any simple formula for how to handle the problem of intentionality without getting into the problem of intentionality again. But I, I do find myself very attracted to the way the law and the courts handled intentionality. Yes. And so they established this rule, which is called, um, by construction of law. And they sort of used it first in murder cases, and then they started to use it in libel cases. And the rough idea was, yeah, like I can't know what you think, Marissa, but let's say you're, uh, heaven forbid, but you're involved in a murder and it's a particularly grisly murder. I don't need to know what you were thinking. By construction of law and by the nature of the act, I can infer it was intentional. Right? So I don't have to sort of go rummaging mm. in my mind. I look at the object and from the object, I derive intentionality. And the same thing starts to happen in libel cases where 
when you have a sort of a, a formulation that seems particularly vicious or nasty, right? Like you're an awful person and uh, you committed a crime and you should be punished and so on and so on. From that textual object, I can derive intentionality by construction of law, by the nature of the speech used. And so therefore, I don't have to go fishing around in your mind to find the, the sort of malice that led to you producing this libelous document. Instead, the document itself provides the malice, provides the intentionality. And I think that's one kind of interesting and, and in fact, somewhat sophisticated way to handle the problem of intentionality in a way that lots of literary historians have had, not only had difficulty with, but have simply decided, I don't deal with intentionality. That's not my problem. I deal with yeah. text, right? But text can have a, possess a type of intentionality. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'm still thinking through how this connects to some of the work I've done on, um, on like news pamphlets during the English Civil War, yeah. many of which are, are satirical. And I was seeing when you were kind of giving your kind of history of like what satire looks like before we get to this like 1670s moment of manuscript satires. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, the kinds of uh, the like claims of being bad at your job the yep. claims of being uh, of uh, committing um, criminal acts yep. and of having a disease um, yes. or particularly an STI kind of disease yes. that um, are like the standard tropes for how royalists are making fun of the Cromwellian government yep. in like the illegal and illicit royalist press of the 17th century. Um, and, and I was wondering if, if like I was thinking about the frameworks you were using and I'm wondering how I'm going to take that back when I start looking at those texts again for thinking through things about um, how I'm in, because I've always interpreted those texts as having political intentions because they're yep. on the surface, they are baldly and like openly political. You don't need to like read them suspiciously to know that they like they are making fun of Cromwell. That is that is their job. Um, but uh but like I think you've given me some frameworks to think with there with that material. And also I saw I saw like echoes in what you were in some of those um, deliciously raunchy <laughs> manuscript satires that were connecting back to these these traditions of the illegal royalist press. Yeah, yeah. and I think and I think you know that's the longer early modern history of those later 17th century manuscript satires is a tradition of invective, right? Yeah. A kind of verbal transparency. So I, I'm wondering with the, with the pamphlets you've been looking at from the mid 17th century, were most of those illegally published, meaning yes. they never went through censorship apparatus, right? They never went through censorship apparatus. Yeah, right. And so this is like one of the weird, um, I don't know, paradoxes of licensing is basically yeah. anything that goes through licensing gets stripped of its sort of seditious qualities, its libelous qualities, defamatory qualities, its blasphemous qualities, right? Everything gets stripped out. Yeah. But if you want to write something that is therefore seditious, blasphemous, uh, regicidal, like go on and on. You yeah. simply find an illegal printer or you circulate it by manuscript. And I can see yeah. Rachel King here. So it's, it's like very nice, uh, sort of our, our like queen of the manuscript print hybrid. And I think this is like one moment in the 17th century where those two things meet very, very closely. So illegal printing operations, especially in London under lic licensing, uh, which is, okay. She's added to the chat. Well, we're gonna address her title later on, but I also would like credit. Um, yeah. where, where illegal printing operations are yeah. linked together with illicit manuscript publications. And, and I say illicit rather than illegal because it's not illegal to write things by hand, right? It's illegal to print and then distribute those things using an unlicensed printer. Um, and so Until I think- later when it becomes illegal to even have copied it. By yes, hand. even have made a copy that was wild when it comes illegal, and and I think one of the things, the reason publication is always this requirement in libel law, by publication they don't mean that you're printing it; they mean that you are making it public to a third party. So theoretically, um, now that we've involved Rachel, I'll, inv I'll involve Rachel again. So let's say I wrote this really nasty defamatory letter to you, Marissa, it, attacking you directly. That itself would not be illegal under one version of the law because I did not make it public. I did not advertise it to a third person. But if I made a copy of that letter and sent it to Rachel, that would constitute publication or making public, at which point 
it could potentially lead to either a civil suit between you and me, or even potentially at a certain period, a criminal prosecution. And so publication is sort of this interesting category because the law uses it in a way that I think is a little bit different from the way, say, a book historian or a literary yeah. historian would think about it where, yeah, a book could be published and no one buys it, then for a literary story, maybe it's, you know, it doesn't really matter, but that's actually the real question that um, they're asking in the courts, right? Who else had access to this object and therefore did it become a public document in the sense that a third party had also access to it? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a capacious definition of publication because it, in because it includes, publication in print, manuscript circulation. Um, in one moment in the text, you say it's like it, even the sewing of the binding is yes. part of the like, act of making. The making, book. right? Making, the, the super making. dubious verb. Yeah, it encompasses everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so there's so many different intermediaries in the trade and in the scribal networks who are a part of that making that it, it, it actually offers um, kind of like the rich version of critical bibliography that we want, where we think about lots of different makers and objects and practices um, that are not delimited either to bibliography alone or book history or manuscript studies alone. So that was a, that was a moment I, I was I like attached to in the text. So I'm yeah. glad to hear you bringing it up here. <laughs> um, before we head into questions from the chat, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about the final chapter where you turn to visual materials, um, because I'm really interested in an argument that re-examines generic decline, because as you know, this is something I've been working on with my work on um, history plays, English chronicle plays, and, and they're, what I see is their afterlife in the English Civil War era. So it, that kind of is an animating thing for me. And you reassess the decline of, a, of satire after a sort of golden age where just the sheer volume of verse satire and manuscript and then printed satire circulating is enormous. Uh, but then you, you show counter that there's this rise of satirical caricatures that are, are being produced in this incredible volume in the the last decades of your study, and um, that this deverbalization is also um, happening in embodied practices on the stage. And this mm -hmm. connects really nicely to like some other work in early modern studies by Richard Price and other people about how clowning and impromptu performance isn't encoded in our play scripts, but mm -hmm. like sometimes we know that it did happen and it, and it does, it really shows like the lacunae we have in our textual record of performance from dramatic texts. But um, I, I want you to speak a little bit to this like re-examination of generic decline and also this like deverbalization and how the laws focus on words allows for these, like for the images that we think of as the most iconic 18th century satirical images coming into being. Yeah, so well, so I'll I'll review just really quickly the this sort of you know li literary historical standard, right? Because I don't yeah. think everyone in eighteenth is in eighteenth century studies here, but the rough idea is by the middle of the eighteenth century, after this golden age or great age of satire, where satire was not only widely practiced and widely printed, but it was practiced by some of the most famous writers during that period, was this incredible exceptional moment in English literary history where satire was sort of at the top of its game. And then in the mid 18th century, it sort of vanishes, or that's sort of the theory. And I think later literary historians, so people like Gary Dyer have shown, this thesis is grossly overstated in the sense that there's lots of satire. There's lots of romantic era satire. Um, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So that, that part is sort of overstated. But I think what's correct about that death of satire thesis is it's, there's quantitatively less satire that exists in the later 18th century, early 19th century. There's relatively less satire in the sense that it doesn't quite saturate the market as much as it once did. And it's definitely lost cultural capital as a form. And so, you know, no longer are the most famous authors of the later 18th century and early 19th century satirists. And so I think that's somewhat true. Yeah. And I track in part, and I will like emphasize the in part, the sort of decline of satire in my accounting is one of the consequences of the ramping up of the legal regime that had focused on these works across the early 18th century. And that effectively the government had arrived at a set of efficient courtroom procedures for prosecuting satirists 
and their stationers. And then by accident, caricature came into being, right? This weird Italian comic art form that, you know, they just hadn't really practiced in the 18th century up until sort of like maybe, you know, kind of a parlor room game thing of the 1730s, but all of a sudden it becomes this massive commercial industry. And so at the very moment where you see printed satire declining, you start to see visual satire rising in really gigantic, gigantic numbers with huge wide distribution. And I think one of the ways to explain that shift in satiric production across different mediums is to note the extent to which the law was obsessed with the verbal qualities of defamation. So trials always focused on the interpretation of textual evidence. And that's something that doesn't quite exist in visual satire. And that's why I call it deverbalization, right? It's satiric works that work by intimation, repetition, juxtaposition, all of these things but they don't often defame through words. Yeah. And so, you know, it, I think it's kind of an interesting part of the history of satire that you can kind of see this migration from heavily verbal satiric media to highly deverbalized satiric media. And that part of the explanation for that is the path dependence of the law, which is obsessed with verbal evidence, not obsessed with visual evidence. And when visual evidence becomes the primary form of defamation, the courts really don't know what to do with it. They can't transliterate it into prosecutable phrases. So I'll leave it off there so that we can kind of jump in with the, the questions that people might have. Thank you guys so much for that conversation. That was really um, super informative. And obviously, Marissa, you are a very careful reader. So <laughs> history of reading should include you. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Let's see, um, please go ahead and drop questions into the chat. You guys can also just, if you want to like raise a hand or just come off of mute and pose your questions yourselves, um, we can also do that. Andrew, you got a very nice comment here from Sophie who had to leave, um, who has long enjoyed your article, libel and satire, the problem with naming. Um, I'm just gonna jump in and, and ask a question just real quick, Andrew. I work more on visual materials and I find I'm just curious because they require so much context and it's so hard. You can't just look at one of these. You're like, I don't know who these people are. And I'm just curious, um, how long did it take you to like really get in? I mean, I don't know. Were there ones that you could just never figure out? Like who's being made fun of? What's going on here? <laughs> um, or did you get really fluent in the language and you just felt like you were like living in the moment and could understand it all? Yeah, so I think it was a kind of learned language, right? So I, I discovered at first, I was lost, right? I would look at a visual satire, nobody would be named in it ever. It would have some sort of abstract title, like a Democrat or reason in philosophy. And I think like, what is satiric about this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, where is the joke? Who is being attacked? And so I was very, very reliant on these British museum catalogs mm -hmm. that were produced across um, I think the late 19th century and 20th mm -hmm. century that documented sort of very carefully like who is in this print, mm -hmm. um, what is the sort of contextual background for these works, um, and so what would be kind of the, the joke or the satire, the message that's being communicated. And I think working on them, increasingly, I was able to understand kind of how caricature had this very closed system of representation. So unlike iconographic traditions where you could look up like, what does it mean when a dwarf is holding cards at a gambling table? Mm -hmm. um, you could sort of, you would see a face and that face would be repeated again and again and again. And so I often said this closed system of representation and caricature, one of the interesting aspects is people were represented on, along consistent visual lines mm -hmm. across decades and among many, many different artists. And so you'd be able to sort of already identify at the personal level who is being targeted mm -hmm. and having that personal identification in some sense of the usually political history at that particular moment would often be enough to give you a sense of how these, these satires were operating. I think the, the problem with caricature, and it's a problem that art historians face a lot is they would like to analyze the object for its aesthetic features or its decorative features or whatever, but they spend so much time having to explain mm -hmm. every single caricature that you kind of get bogged down in the context aspect and you lose the sense that this is an art form and that this art form, even if you have all the context requires interpretation mm -hmm. on top of that, which again, maybe goes back to exactly where Marissa and I started, but it was 
for myself as well, like a, an opportunity to learn to read in a new way. And it was a very peculiar um, and somewhat short-lived language of personal defamation through caricature as a specific aesthetic form. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I have looked at those volumes. They are super helpful. <laughs> They're very helpful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Rachel, I see your hand up. Could you um, pose your question, please? Hey, thank you guys for that. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, I was wondering, Andrew, if you could talk a little bit about being in a sort of interdisciplinary field like law and literature. Um, like, how have you had to balance those two fields and how do you, I mean, obviously I think everyone who thinks of themselves as in an, in an interdisciplinary field hopes that both sides will read the work, right? Um, sometimes it's a little hard to get that to happen. Um, but yeah, I guess, how are you thinking about like your ideal readership and um, how you're trying to bring these fields together? Yeah, um, thank you, Rachel, good to see you. Uh, so. So uh, yeah, I you know I think this is the thing that strangely obsessed me as a methodological question at the beginning. So the the problem for me is I thought oh I have so much evidence I I believe this the sort of thesis I'm pursuing is correct about the mutual shaping of law and literature across this period. But I did want, I did want legal scholars to read it and not only literary scholars who are interested in things like history of reading satire evolution of literary forms, things like that. And one of the, and one of sort of like my philosophical position or disciplinary position was the idea that I have to speak to both literary scholars in the issues that they're interested in. But while I'm speaking to literary scholars, I need to speak to legal scholars in terms that they would understand and that they would also find useful. So something like irony, is something that literary scholars spend lots of time, you know, teaching in classrooms or writing about in their own work, but it's definitely not something that legal historians or legal theorists spend a lot of time with, even if they understand the basic concepts around irony. And so those were moments in the book where I thought, oh, the kind of literary theories that exist might actually be of interest to legal scholars if you can transpose those theories into legal terminology to a certain extent, right? Using shared terminology around things like malice and intention, but then also um, shared interest in textual manif manifestations of certain types of intentionality. So yeah, it, it was like never an easy thing. I think um, I was constantly sort of asking myself, if I was a legal scholar, what would I find interesting in this particular discussion? And if I was a literary scholar, what would I find interesting in this particular discussion? And it was like a, a true attempt to balance those two things. And hopefully the uh, legal scholars will find it as interesting as the literary scholars. But it's a good question. And I often think, you know, having an abstract philosophical position about your methodology is a good thing, but it really comes down to like what it looks like in words on the page and whether both groups of scholars are going to be able to see themselves in the questions you're asking, but also the answers you're providing. Great. Well, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Ersi. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, for this really, really interesting conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I am one of those art historians who is uh, having to figure out ways to insert a discussion about aesthetics. And, and it's not only that, it's about how, how the aesthetic aspect actually contributes to the satire um, mm -hmm. in caricatures. And it's not just the, the two are separate, it's, it's you know um, intimately linked. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more because this question of, um, I really like your explanation. I, uh, I, I've used your other article about the de deverbalization of satire um, and, I'm, I'm curious about how this shift happens and why um, the visual is considered so um, acceptable or so not libelous and why is it that intentionality can't be um, seen? You know, if intentionality is the question, then why can it not be seen in the visual uh, caricature to the point that caricature with all its, you know, scatology and all these other elements that are, I mean, obviously grossly uh, attacking the royal family and, and the politicians and, and whatnot, it ends up becoming a symbol of British liberty. So it ends up being a point of pride 
mm -hmm. at the end of the 18th century and you know especially comparing to and then beginning of the 19th comparing to what happens with you know napoleon and all that in france so i, I don't know if, if that's a very clear question but can, can you go in a little bit more into that shift no, no. So you're you're embodying like a series of of moments where I like spent banging my head on a table trying to understand like why is it they can figure out how to prosecute written satires, but they can't figure out how to prosecute visual satires. Which, which I mean, I think probably you would know this having worked with them, but they're, they're it's like incredible what's inside of these visual satires, right? And you don't even have to spend all that time like reading them and figuring them out. Like sometimes. They are just incredibly offensive. And I think there is no sense whatsoever during the 18th century that these are not works that are equally libelous, equally defamatory, equally seditious as any, anything that's sort of written during the earlier 18th century. The problem they bump into is always a procedural one. And it was this appropriation of libel law to prosecute written works just led to this weird focus on verbal evidence as the only useful form of evidence when it comes to defamation. And so even in the early 18th century, when they get cases that seem to have visual materials attached to them, they spend all of their time focusing on the poem that was next to the visual material or the newspaper article that was next to the visual material. And they spend no time actually analyzing the image because there isn't some easy courtroom mechanism to translate images into words because words are the only thing that's prosecutable. And, and I think you know, one form of evidence that suggested this was the case to me were these wonderful accounts from the Secretary of State, often in letters to the Attorney General where the attorney general would send one of these caricatures of the royal family to the secretary of state or to the solicitor general and say, this has to be prosecuted, right? Like this is, this is outrageous. On top of which private citizens would sometimes go to different legal figures and say, um, I don't know if you've seen, I'm being attacked as like a naked whale um, in this window. I would really appreciate if you did something to maybe prosecute the individuals responsible. And the Solicitor General or the Secretary of State would always write the same thing. Like, I agree with you. This seems outrageous. This seems defamatory. This seems incredibly offensive. And yet it would require so much difficult argumentation in a courtroom of law that it's not advisable to prosecute. Because what happens over the course of the 18th century and what people learn again and again and again is that any form of prosecution is a republication of the libel and draws even more attention to this object that the individual wishes to suppress. And so when it comes to especially visual satires, the strategy that develops is usually a kind of tactical silence around these things. Or in the case of George IV, um, first buying up anything that he finds offensive, which is how the Windsor Castle collection of satires balloons up to like 2700 or something like that and then bribing people and bribery turns out to be the most effective and so Gilray, uh, Rowlandson, the Crookshank brothers, all of them took bribes, all of them took bribes from different political parties and often the bribes were or sometimes the bribes were to produce counter propaganda on behalf of that individual but most often the bribes were simply taken so that they'd stop commenting on specific issues, particularly relating to the royal family. So it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's so, I, I, I'm sort of shocked every time I look at some of the images I've collected for this project, but yeah, there's, there's no simple answer um, beyond some of the, the, the failure of the mechanisms that's developed over the 18th century for the courtroom interpretation of images. Mm -hmm. Because it's the opposite in France. It's the image that gets prosecuted and not the or censored and not the. And, and how does it? Is there any? Is there anything that talks about how it becomes like this symbol of liberty in in England? Because I know that in the late eighteenth they're already talking about this, like you know, kind of pounding their chests. But or I mean, I know there's another question. So I don't, but have you? If you have you seen anything? And if so, I'll just write to you and ask you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think, I, you know, interestingly, a lot of, so a lot of the open discussions about the ways in which these are, the, that this right to caricature is a kind of peculiarly British liberty, especially I think after like the 16, 1760s, 1770s, 
um, come strangely from the accounts of foreigners who are visiting London and then see these print shop windows and say like, I cannot believe like what people are putting up of the royal family often across the street from the royal palaces. And at least one of those sources, I think it was a, a um, Spanish historian, is Antonio Paz, I think, had said, had said like, and this is what the British call their liberty. And the comment I think is actually very dismissive of this particular kind of British liberty, which also makes me feel as if this individual had said to somebody, what's going on with these caricatures against the royal family? And that the standard line of response, even then by like the 1760s, 1770s was, this is what we call our liberty and we have a right to do this. So I, you know, I think I have fewer examples, I think of caricaturists philosophically discussing or theoretically discussing a right to caricature and a greater number of examples of foreigners trying to explain what's going on with these particular kinds of British caricatures and windows. But it's a great, uh, yeah, it's a great question. It's huge, a huge topic. There's British journalists too. I'll send you the thing. Please, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, Andrew, we're gonna see if you can do a speed answer to this last question that's in the chat here. Um, okay. So you don't, well, I thought you knew me better than this, Holly. I have no speed <laughs> answers, but okay, go well, ahead. I hate, to, I hate to rush, I love yeah. listening to you um, to talk here, but just to stick to our time. Um, yeah. It's basically a question about, um, different price points. And so are there, is there a difference between the satire you'd see in broadsides um, versus more high market works? Yes, so there, there are different forms of satire and they seem to circulate at different market levels. But I think one thing that might be surprising is the extent to which even uh, written satire all the way through to visual satire in the 18th century does really belong to elite markets. I don't think it's something that is as widely accessible as maybe some earlier historians of particularly caricature have suggested, but also even um, literary historians. I think we've sort of reached a pretty accurate correction point in identifying how large the markets are. You did it. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> Oh, this was delightful. I do wish we could continue and have uh, more conversation, but um, thank you everybody so much for joining. We love um, doing these book parties to celebrate our, um, our fellows' wonderful work, and um, we will pick up with some new book parties next spring, so, or sorry, next fall. Thank you, Andrew, for being here in the spring with us, and um, thank you everybody for joining us. That's it for today. Yes, <laughs> thank you for having me. Thanks for joining, and thanks, Marissa, for being such a good reader. <laughs> oh, thank you for writing such a good book. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.